listening to the Inspire Excellence Podcast, recorded at the BVA headquarters with your hosts, Bill Whitaker and Tommy Alquist. Bill is the former CEO of the J.R. Simplot Company and is now a full-time adventure seeker and philanthropist. Tommy is the CEO of BVA Development, co-founder of Crush the Curve Idaho, and most importantly, a full-time grandfather. Each episode focuses on sharing the stories of individuals who are changing the world. Welcome to this week's episode of Inspire Excellence Podcast. We have a very special guest this week. We're excited. Uh, joining Bill and I is Mike Boren, founder of Clearwater Analytics uh, here out of Boise, Idaho, and also a good friend and uh, outdoor enthusiast, pilot. Uh, I'm trying to think of all the all the ways to describe Mule you. Skinner. Mule Skinner. Mule Skinner. Absolutely. Uh, Mike just got here and pulled out a picture of an elk that he just shot with the uh, son-in-law last week. Big time outdoorsman. Mike, we... Appreciate you and look forward to, to today's conversation. And uh, I know you well, but I want to start with telling us a little bit about growing up in Idaho. Okay. Well, um, my father was a professor, so we did move around a little bit. Uh, he taught in Utah and Indiana and Montana, but finally moved to Boise State. But the one constant was we spent every summer, the whole summer, in the Sotheys. He, my dad has spent every summer of his life there and lives there full-time now. And uh, that was a great gift that he gave to us, that we were always in Idaho for the full summer in the mountains. So I know Dave and you pretty well. Talk a little more about your dad. He, he's he's a legend. I mean, there's no other way to put it. And you were raised by a legend. Uh, I Quick story about him. I hadn't seen him for a while, and I saw him at your place uh, about a month ago. Mm-hmm. And he just had a valve replacement, okay, and was pretty sick before it actually was passing out driving himself down down to the hospital down to the hospital sure. <laughs> like really sick yeah. and 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 had had this valve replacement and i was excited to see him to say hey how are you doing and he looked great and i went up to him and i said hey hey bob how are you how are you doing and he looked at me and said i've never felt better and he just started talking and he's like the most optimistic person i've ever been around tell me about your dad because he's he's something else well one of the things he told me i think that same night was remember when you promised me that if i got down to a certain weight, which was like 60 pounds <laughs> off, um, you would take me elk hunting again on one of your mules. And I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm back to the weight where I got married. You owe me a hunt. <laughs> My dad's 84. Oh, God. Almost 84. He comes yeah. 84 next week. And uh, he's a tough old bird, and he's, uh, he's an interesting guy. Um, when I was young, he had a plaque on the wall that someone had given him it had a picture of him, and uh, it said, Bob Boren, the great peacemaker. And my dad and my mom argued like crazy at the dinner table every single night. <laughs> now, they were both um, national collegiate champion debaters, and so that was sport. Um, <laughs> but if you just met him at the dinner table, you would wonder about the peacemaker thing. But he is. Everybody loves him. He helps everybody. He's just a genuinely nice guy. and. I'm hopeful that, you know, sometime within the next 40 years, I get like 1% of that because I'm not a very good peacemaker. (laughs) You got the debater, though. I got the debater part, and (laughs) maybe the rest will come eventually. But he's just a genuinely nice guy. Everybody likes him. Uh, He retired early from Boise State and promptly got busier than he'd ever been. Uh, At one point, I think he was either the chairman of the board or a board member for nine organizations including a big national utility and uh, just a busy, but happy and, and productive guy. Yep. Really great guy. Having said that, he also seems to find time to fish about five or six days a week. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 84. In that, yeah. in that part of Idaho, I can't tell everyone you meet, Hey, do you know, Bob, yeah. you met Bob. I just, he's just, he's a legend. So up there. one little quick story. My wife was in the grocery store up there and she was talking to the, sheriff's deputy and he was with a new sheriff's deputy and he introduced her and he introduced her as bob boren's daughter-in-law and uh the guy said who's bob boren and the deputy said you don't know bob boren he's the richest guy in this area <laughs> he's a college professor but he really is because he has so many friends and yeah. he's just you know has rich experiences he's a really good guy so thanks for asking about yeah, it. That's great. What uh, before we get off off your father because I just love the guy. What what's the number one lesson he taught you, Mike? 
Oh, I remember riding. This is interesting. You asked that. I remember riding in the truck with him. He had a 55 Dodge and you could see the highway underneath your feet because it had broken up wood floorboards. We're driving in his 55 Dodge somewhere to go fishing. And I was talking about all my plans. And uh, I was going to do this and that. And I was going to make a lot of money. And I had like three or four things that were big wish list items. One was to have a home in the Sawtooth Valley. Another was to have a jet, and another was to be a helicopter pilot. And I was telling all this stuff, and, and uh, you know, I was just anxious to get going on life. And he said, money is not that hard to come by, but time and friendship. Mm, wow. Those are hard things. Yeah. And he said, everybody has the same amount of time or less, and you don't know how much you have. And he said, take good care of your time. Mm. And I've always remembered that. And it was, you know, we're just driving along. It wasn't like this big philosophical question or conversation. He just. Good for him. That was, that's a piece yeah. of advice that's always, has always stuck with me. And I've really tried um, to avoid the concept of quality time with my kids, for example, and focus on quantity of time hmm. and spend, spend real hmm. meaningful time with my family. And uh, that's because of my dad. He always did that. Is that the advice you, that we have a lot of young entrepreneurs that listen to this? Um, a lot of business leaders balance, finding balance in their life, I think is as hard as ever. We're just connected all the time. It seems like you, you can't go anywhere without having a call or a text or an email. I know you do that. And I've been around you and your kids. And I think that's part of your legacy truly is, I mean, you and your kids do things together like real things. Yeah. Um, how, how easy is that? Is, is it, you have to be very intentional with it. How do you not let, cause you also are incredibly successful business wise. And I know you're, no one has a bigger drive than you, but how, how did you put limits on yourself or what were your, what were, cause we, we talk about a lot. I, everyone I know says, Hey, we got to find balance. Got to find balance. Got to always check yourself. What did you find that kept you in check? I wasn't looking for balance. I made a commitment that the most important thing for me was raising a good family. And I spent time with my kids mm. and it was often to the detriment of my business. Mm. Um, there have been times in my life where I truly didn't have the time to do both. And uh, I always have spent real meaningful time every week with my children, every, uh, every night if I could. And I can remember when I had a struggling business uh, and times were tough and we had a year where we didn't make any money. And uh, every night, almost every night, let's say five nights a week at the kitchen table, I spent doing math with my 13 year old daughter that didn't have it figured out. Mm. That's Amanda, who, as you know, is a superstar <laughs> and nobody would think that, but uh, when she was young, she didn't read till the third grade and she had, she struggled with math and mm. I, I spent time I didn't have and it was the best time I ever I love that. spent. There you have it, Amanda. <laughs> uh, he's going public. <laughs> on you yeah. and uh <laughs> but i can tell you're proud of her also oh she's great yeah, yeah. everybody it's that knows her fantastic. would say that she's she's a really great kid and it's not because we sat at the dinner table doing math but i think it is partly because her mother and i focused on making sure that we had meaningful time meaningful quantities of That's time good. with our kids and we still try to do that awesome you know what? What's interesting to me about this whole balance thing that I think we all kind of sort through it. You and I, Tommy, we've talked about it. We've, you know, what does it mean? What does it look like? And I really like your answer on that, Mike. At the same time, um, I, don't, I don't know if I don't know if we need to be intentional about balance. I think we need to be intentional about what's important to mm -hmm. us. I agree, and I that. think that's what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's a great way to look at it. I mean, I, you know, in, instead of saying don't find balance, prioritize and make sure you're taking care of your top priorities first and things will work out. Yeah. yeah and I'm not saying, you know, just play all the time. I, you can't be successful in business without working hard. No. But you're playing more now than you used to. I don't know if I actually am. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I probably am. But uh, it, it seems pretty busy. <laughs> Well, so, all that I know is I want him to take me elk hunting because he doesn't, he does <laughs> not shoot elk. I don't know if he's not capable or he just Probably gives them capable. all up to his guests. And, uh, that's pretty amazing that <laughs> you've missed getting an elk. How many times? 
Oh, I don't. I just don't focus on that. I you love get to go you with take people. care right. I think it's fantastic. And, right. uh, I I just really enjoy it. And it's not about shooting an elk. It's about being out in the woods right. hunting for them. It's always more fun for me to be hunting than just walking around aimlessly. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, hey, a hey, shifting gears to Clearwater because I think a lot of people know yeah. the story. Um, I think I've known you for a long time, and just watching the way you worked with your partners, which the founders were you and your brother, Dave, and then Doug Bates mm -hmm. and watching your relationship and then how hard you worked and the vision you had for where this thing was going. I love the story. Um, tell us a little bit about that ride, that journey and, and where you guys started. And then you had an exit, uh, recently. Um, but, but the number of jobs you've created, the, 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 the lives you've created and livelihoods you've created along the way. I know that was really important to you too. For anyone that's growing a business, talk about how important having a vision is and, and the direction and the partnerships you had. Cause I think you're a great example of that. Well, and uh, the partnerships is important and flexibility is important. I will say right now that I am not uh, the greatest original innovator or inventor out there. And in fact, we had a fourth partner that was Dave, Doug and me and Chris Grounding that started Clearwater. And really, Chris came to us with the idea, and we adapted it and ran with it and modified it. And uh, we stayed in the business longer than he did. But uh, Dave, Dave and I started a hedge fund in 1995 together and left our other businesses. Dave was a portfolio, an internal trader, portfolio manager at Goldman Sachs. And I had a brokerage business in Chicago. And we started a hedge fund so that we could be here in Idaho with our families. And uh, have our families be supportive of each other, which has worked out to be really great. And uh, later we brought Doug Bates in and we were just managing money for people. And Chris came along with this idea of um, being able to do really good investment portfolio reporting that no one was doing. And we said, well, in fact, we're already doing that for all of our hedge fund clients. And we showed him our reporting and said, this is exactly what we need, but for the institutional investment market and the corporate treasury market and we hadn't thought of that so um, we started clearwater advisors with him to manage money for people and do all this great reporting and then one of our clients made it clear to us that the reporting was a lot better than the money management and we should focus on that and so we ran with that and uh, there have been consistent opportunities to refine what we did and do better things and more things based on the ideas that our clients came to us with. And I think if I was to really say, you know, if you asked me what we were the best at, I would say it's adapting to the needs of clients. Mm -hmm. So listening That's to great. people and providing what's best for them rather than what we think might be best for them. And uh, and that's, I, that's I've got the success I've got several Mike isms things that you say all the time that just really stick with me. But oftentimes I've been in a meeting with you and we'll be talking about something that's relatively complicated or we're trying to find our way. And you'll just say, it's easy. Just do something that'll make someone's life better. You say that all the time. Will it make you better? Is the purpose of your, of your goal, your business to help people have better lives? And it, it simplifies it so much that it, it, everyone's like, oh yeah, we just need to do the thing that will make someone's life better. And, and so I'll, I'll always, not, in fact, I've started using it. I try to give you credit most of the time. You don't, you don't have to give me credit. I'm sure I stole it from somebody, but, uh, isn't that what we're about, right? And every business that we're in is satisfying the client it's yeah. delighting the client it's making the client happier, more successful, making the client in my business have more free time to go to their kids lacrosse game or basketball game or go do things with their family because we made their lives easier at the end of the month. Yeah. And Clayton, Clayton Christensen talked about it being what job needs to be done. I mean, there's a lot of jobs that need to be done for me. Um, but the, he used to talk about at Harvard, what job needs to be done. So, yeah. and, and there's an interesting thing there. Plenty of times the client doesn't actually know for sure what that job is or what's going to make, him or her more happy or successful, but the market in general tends to know. So it's, it's important to listen to the client, but not always do exactly what one client thinks is the best thing. Just listen yeah. to all of the clients and then produce something that's ubiquitous. Mm. That well, solves problems for everyone. Important statement. Seriously. 
that's valuable. So, Mike, I, if when you talk about innovation and um, and talk about how, so what you're saying is this. So Clearwater may not been about just pure. This is where the market's going. We're going to differentiate differentiate ourselves with something incredibly innovative. What you guys really did is just said, there's something that needs to happen here. And there's a value point that's not being served in the marketplace. And you guys addressed it. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Yes. And then we modified it every day. Did you really? Because that's yeah. another, um, another thing that's important to me is uh, I want to, at the end of the day, be better at serving my client than I was at the beginning of the day or the day was a failure. And Doug Bates is all about that. That's one of his big things is, am I smarter and better and more capable at the end of the day? And I would just modify that to, am I doing a better job for the client Good. today than I was yesterday? Yeah. And if I am, yesterday was a success and today started out well. Right. But you got you to get better every day because, you know, it's, it's grow or die. And competition is a wonderful thing. Pricing is a wonderful thing because it teaches you a lot. And uh, you, you've got to be able to adapt and be better every day. Yep. There's no value to doing the same thing for your client today that you did a year ago. Oh, you know, I remember when Clearwater came into play and I used to go, what, what is Clearwater? You know, what, what's going on with <laughs> Clearwater? Yeah. You know, do they deliver water to the to your house or office or whatever. I'm joking, but the point of it is it's in a move from being, Hey, Clearwater, this is pretty interesting to, wow, look what Clearwater's doing. Then all of a sudden you're kind of going, it's one of the absolute rock star companies, not just in our area, but in, in your field of work. And so it's a real compliment to the three of you for what you've created. I watch it. I've watched it closely for the last, I guess eight or 10 years before that I was in the, what is Clearwater mode? Yeah. I think a lot of people have been in that because we didn't spend a lot of time in Boise <laughs> talking about what we do because <laughs> we spent a lot of time talking to clients about what they need. Yeah. Good point. And we haven't good been point. so great about marketing until I think more recently. Yeah. Hey, talk about one other, I just thought it was curious just because it's different than anything I've seen is the first time we spent some time together and, remember going to your building and you had the three of you in one office and I just thought, Oh, these guys are, you know, kind of bootstrapping a little bit, being, con being conservative on space and they're all jammed in one office together. Right. And then when you went to your new building downtown, one of the key principles was no, we're all in the same office. Mm -hmm. it, you don't see companies do that. Right. Um, where, I mean, I, I, I hadn't. And so it, it, it's super interesting to me, but talk about why that was important to you for someone that might be listening out there of, of the three of you being on the same page. I think we were fortunate in the industry that we came from, which was fixed income investment management, where you might sit in a giant room or you might be in a trading pit with 500 people. And there's all this extraneous noise. And when somebody comes to see you in that setting, they're like, how can you possibly work here? It's crazy. It's noisy. It's chaotic. How can you focus? And my point was always, I can focus. Focus is fine. You can focus through anything. You can learn to, to focus. But what you can't do is replicate the flow of information that's coming in and being filtered subconsciously. And so on a trading floor, or say in the trading pits in Chicago, you can be standing there and you can actually not even know why, but know it's time to buy mm. and not be able to, like there's no conscious understanding of why it's time to buy, but it's time to buy. And it's weird, but being in a room with Dave and Doug and used to be with Chris, there used to be four of us in a room, but being in that room together, you know, Dave might be having a conversation that's wholly unrelated to what I'm doing, but I hear something and it sparks something in my mind and I know there's a call I need to make, or I know when that guy leaves the office, I've got to, I've got to, excuse me, I've got to tell Dave, you got to do this. Yeah. And I can't even tell you why, but it's nice to have that extra information that comes. And I, there were just the three of us in the room, but I wouldn't have minded being in a room of 30. Mm. And 
I can focus. And you might say, well, you can't very easily have a private conversation. And my point is there aren't many times in the life of Clearwater when the chief operating officer needs to have a private conversation. And mm. we can always find a conference room for those few times. Yeah, that's so I loved it. I, I miss it. That's one thing I don't have now. I'm in an office by myself. I might be looking at the sawtooths. <laughs> Yeah. I've seen your office right now. You're not missing anything. Well, but you'll let Joan come in and say hello. Or well, when we were building the house, I had a you know when nothing's finished, I had put with pen on the wall and going to the office. No girls and girls was G R I L S, and I thought it was funny. <laughs> Turns out it wasn't, so it's gone. It, it was not funny. <laughs> you know, I get a kick out of Mike. Um, and Mike, you do this, and you probably don't even realize you do it, but we get this these texts going among a handful of us, right? And um, and they get a little goofy and <laughs> kind of some slapstick type stuff to them. Not with Mike; he cuts to the he just cuts to the chase. It's it's just a few words, and he can make more out of a few words than all the rest of us with all the junk we text back and forth in the evening. So. What I'm I hearing love here is I'm not very funny. That's yeah, no, you're incredible. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, that's great. So, hey, um, shifting gears just a little bit, hey, talk to us about the mules and horses and the backcountry. I mean, mm. you know my passion for the backcountry. You do it. I do it with a motor. Uh, you just happen to do it with real live animals. So. Well, I've actually done a little bit of it with a motor, but I'm not as tough as you are. It's a little <laughs> yeah. scary. Oh, no. So. Um, I, I think that the mule is the original ATV. Yeah, that's right. And uh, they're smart and they're self-sufficient yeah. and uh, they're tough. Yeah. And I just love mules and I love taking them in the backcountry. And uh, I really love it when someone else shoots an elk and I don't have to pack it out. I can <laughs> yeah. throw it on the mule. Yeah, for sure. Um, I just, uh, you know. You but say, you have horses also. So in our family, mm -hmm. uh, we have horses and mules. And the balance depends on the balance of power in the family <laughs> because my wife and daughters like horses. And oh, okay. my son seems indifferent. He's not on his dad's side here. And I like mules. Yeah. And so right now we have more horses than mules. And when the daughters lived around us, we had lots more. I actually have one daughter that I think is a mule gal too. Yeah. My, my <laughs> bow hunting buddy. Um, I think she likes mules a lot too, but. There's, it's, it's a balance of power thing. So my wife likes horses more than mules, and I, I would have only mules. Now, Mike, you actually trim their feet. Ooh. Can you shoe also? I do not trim their feet and shoe. Oh, I thought you did. Um, okay. I could. Yeah. My dad used to do that Maybe when I was a kid. Maybe that's what we talked about. I think that's dad. what we talked That's exactly about. right. And uh, I think it was hard for my dad to do that because my father does not curse. <laughs> and I think an, an essential element of shoeing a horse is is the proper language. Yeah, that's right. So it's, it was hard for him. And uh, but no, I, I don't do that. But I I train, yeah, and I spend a lot of time with them. Um, but I don't I don't shoe them. <laughs> I hire that out. But so at the same time, you're with the mules almost on a day to day basis. I mean, this isn't just a well, they live at our hobby. house. Yeah. But, I mean, you're uh, working with them all the time. I would say that was one of the things that lost out in the in the balance discussion is the mules didn't get as much attention when I had teenagers. Because yeah. they were kind yeah, of stubborn right. enough themselves, shall right. we say. But uh, I like to spend time with the mules. I'll yeah. be spending time with one tonight and tomorrow. <laughs> now, when you're not hunting, will you just go ride we back a lot in the of mountains? Riding. And, yeah. Yeah. So... We um, chose places to live here in, in the Southeast Valley where we can ride from the house. Right. And uh, and we do. And yeah, that's great. Yeah, like to ride, like to get out in the mountains. Also, like to to. super accomplished pilot. You uh -huh. have a you have a some planes that I've been lucky enough to be in, and and between the planes and the sawtooth and the hunting in the sawtooth a serious love for Idaho and you've been to more places. Uh, it's just fascinating to spend time with Mike up there. Cause you know so much about the Satus. Talk about your love of Idaho, the country we live in. Um, I mean, I know sometimes uh, I pause, we've talked about this and you look at where we live and the opportunities we have here. And it's kind of, it's really humbling 
to, 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 to be, be in America, be in Idaho. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Cause I think some of my most inspiring talks with you, Mike, have been when we've had those discussions about just how blessed we are. So the most important thing to me is freedom and the responsibility that goes with it. We've talked about this, that Freedom isn't one of those things where you get to choose whatever you do and not accept the consequences. Consequences are the good part of freedom, right? Because you learn what was something you don't want to do again and you get rewarded for the good things. And I love that. And I love living in Idaho where so many people have that same core principle of freedom and agency. And, um, you know, let me take care of myself mm -hmm. and I'll take the risks and the, and the rewards that go with that. And I love that. Um, Idaho itself, you know, I was raised here and it's something I learned from my parents. My dad has an incredible love of the mountains and the rivers of Idaho. Um, he told me once that he didn't think that he ever needed to travel anyplace else, although he does, but uh, he could go someplace different in Idaho every day for the rest of his life and be excited and entertained and enriched and never see everything. And it's really true. And I try to get around and I try to see quite a bit of Idaho, but it's wonderful. As far as the love of the country, I think um, the concept of our country is just amazing. Um, it's so great that we had the founders of the country that believed in freedom and independence and, and responsibility and that tried to put us on a footing that would last forever. Um, there are a lot of forces arrayed against that, but I, I still believe that um, each person in their heart really wants to be free, even if they're afraid of what goes with that. Mm. And uh, I, I love the opportunities that I've had in my life. I, it's almost hard to believe how fortunate I've been in terms of being able to see and do things and kind of make my own way. Mm. Wow. Okay, here's the big question. One day we were talking about you taking your helicopter and flying it to Alaska. Have you done that yet? No. Are you still serious about doing that? Yes, I, I wanted to do that this summer. Right. And I had planned to do it and I had everything planned. And for me, all that means is a rough idea of a route and a knowledge of every place I could get gas along the way. <laughs> That's what I mean by everything planned because I like to wing it. But uh, uh, Canada wouldn't let me across the border. Right. This summer. Because I had the of same COVID. Problem. Yeah, right. And so I was not able to do it. I expect that next summer there's a better opportunity, and I plan to do it. So your range for the helicopter is what, four or five, three or four hundred miles? Four or five hundred miles. Four or five. Yeah, but that's that's a lot of time sitting. So I, I, I might have to stop and look at something and walk around a little bit, <laughs> if you know what I mean. You're going to have to stop a few times. <laughs> Especially if I take him and his Diet Coke. Yeah, Diet Pepsi, you whatever he takes. <laughs> That's right. Then we have to stop more. What a trip. What a trip. Oh, That's I look fantastic. forward to it. But you do those sorts of trips. Yeah, all the I was time. I was gonna go this year. I was determined since I you know, I was I was literally planning on going to Eastern Europe and riding the Eastern Bloc countries and wow. I've got a motorcycle sitting over there. But the point is, uh, I decided, you know, that's okay, I'll just go to um to uh, Prudhoe Bay and I'll just ride up and back. And I've done it once before, not to Prudhoe Bay, but the Arctic Circle at the time. Yeah. And I couldn't get across the border. Right. And it was pretty disappointing. But I'm at Eureka, Montana. Oh, gosh, a few weeks ago, uh, maybe six weeks ago. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to try to cross the border. Yeah. And God, did they give me the third degree? And yeah. so you, there's they just no way. There's no sense to, of humor at all. Yeah, there was no <laughs> sense of humor about it. Yeah. Besides, you have to ride about five miles into Canada, which made it worse. So they even inspected my everything oh yeah and before they let me turn around and go back so. so i've been a little concerned because i fly up to alaska i i flew three times this summer to alaska oh, did you? yeah um, and i go up and i i stop in ketchikan or petersburg or sitka for fuel yeah. but as i'm flying up there all my safety valves are in canada I'm thinking, what happens if, you know, you I develop land. some engine trouble, I have to land somewhere. You'll go into quarantine. we are going to quarantine for a year. I don't know what the <laughs> rules are. Maybe they'll just shoot me, but not with a pistol because they only allow rifles. Yeah, right? that's right. That's right. 
That's right. That's yeah, so right. it's it's been interesting, and I hope that we get well, through we that. we need to get back to normal next year, and I, yeah. well, let's just hope we do. Yeah. If you would keep crushing the curve a little bit more, maybe. <laughs> Listen, um, crush the curve is really impressive to me, and uh, you've been an important part of it as Tommy and, uh, and our whole group. But it's been really – it's an important point of pride for me to be involved with all of you. So, yeah, it's been fun. Well, yeah. it's been great for me to be able to learn from both of you. I yeah, mean, it's right. the first time that I met Bill was with Crush That's the true. That's, That's right. That's and exactly. I just didn't realize what I'd been missing. Yeah, me too. The feelings are now I'm going to come over for dinner sometime. You better. To, to Stanley. Yes. Every time I go through, I say, got to call. <laughs> I have to call Mike and Joan because I know there's a dinner there. So this big motorcycle came roaring down my driveway a few weeks ago. Yeah. And I thought, finally, there he is. Bill, he's he finally showing up. <laughs> Right? It wasn't me. It was Sandy Beebe. <laughs> oh, I, wasn't really? I didn't even know he was a cyclist. I thought he was a, a airplane guy. Yeah. <laughs> so good. I will be. I over. thought it would be you though. Well, Mike, be this has been great. We appreciate your friendship and you coming on. I and and you in between elk hunts, squoze us in. So so thank you. We'll let you go. One more one more question because I do think um, you spoke at our Inspire Excellence Summit, and we recorded it. And I came home from that and sent it out to three or four of the of the CEOs that are here uh, locally and just said, hey, I know you weren't there, but you need to listen to this. Mm-hmm. And by just giving some advice, if, if you're a business leader out there, entrepreneur, starting your own business, you have some really sage advice that you've I've heard before. But but let's end with that of what you would tell those those starting businesses, uh, what, what the key to your success was, because I think it's really powerful. Oh, gee, I hadn't thought about this, but I think the key to success is what we already talked about. You need to be doing something that is valuable to a client that makes them more successful and more happy and more fulfilled in life. I think that's the number one most important thing. And you need to be better at it every day. So you've always got to be trying to improve. Um, You need to make sure that everybody gets benefit out of it. Everybody being, first of all, the client second your employees third you and fourth the community and uh, a lot of that has to do not just with finding something good to do and um, being better at it every day but also with pricing things appropriately so that everyone gets rewarded and feels good about it so i'm a strong believer in the market economy i think if you look at the few places of our economy that are really dysfunctional they're not markets Two of those would be healthcare and education. Yep. And they don't actually use price to clear the market and to help people make good decisions. So I'm, I'm a firm believer in uh, in pricing things appropriately and being proud of your pricing and willing to willing to defend it and not you know, not not shying away from pricing discussions. And uh, I think we've talked about this. I think the other thing is you need to have a sustainable life where you feel good about what you're doing and you're helping other people not just your clients, but family and friends and, and having, a, you know, having a purpose in life that's really beyond you. Um, I, I love going to work. I miss some of the things about not having a full-time day job, but I've got all these other things that I'm doing where I feel like I'm being helpful to other people in their businesses. And uh, that's, that's very fulfilling. I would be the first to say that there are lots of business people that are much more successful than I am and understand business better or they're more innovative. But, uh, you know, I'm I'm always trying to be better every day. And uh, I feel like there are some lessons I've learned that maybe I can explain to people so they don't have to learn them quite the same way that I did. I don't, I don't know what of that is the key to success. The whole thing is awesome. Yeah. It's so. awesome. I, I love it. I, mean, I love it because I think the way the way you're able to articulate that, I just think it's so easy for people to understand. That's what I love about you is because you can really understand it and it sinks in. You're like, that makes sense to me. And that's a, that's a gift because not everyone can do that. So thank you for for what you do, for the example you are to us and and for your mentorship right. of us because it's right. it's awesome. Thanks we we'll both appreciate you your friendship. Buddy. You've been really good mentors thank to me. You. So fun. I appreciate it. All right. You've been listening to Inspire Excellence podcast. Uh, join us next time where we'll tell another 
inspiring story that hopefully helps you in your day-to-day lives. You've been listening to the Inspire Excellence Podcast. We hope you've heard something today that will inspire you to make a difference in the world. Join us again for our next episode. Oh, 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 oh,